Welcome to History, It Happens. I am Mr. P, and I'm here to talk to you for a couple of minutes today about American isolationism during the 1930s. It took Americans nearly three years just to enter World War I, and even though we were on the victorious side of the Allies, we did not want to enter into a war like that again. George Washington's admonition in his farewell address that we avoid entangling alliances cast a long shadow on the American mind. When President Woodrow Wilson went to France to meet with the other three members of the Big Four, Britain's David Lloyd George, France's George Clemenceau, and Italy's Vittorio Orlando, Wilson had grand plans with his 14 points, including forming an international peacekeeping organization, the League of Nations. While it was included as a provision in the final Treaty of Versailles, many Americans, including influential Republican Senator Henry Havert Lodge, saw the League as one of those entangling alliances that George Washington warned against. Henry Cabot Lodge worked hard to keep the United States out of the League, which never joined, and to a large degree the United States turned its back on the rest of the world. Once the United States, along with the rest of the world, slipped into the Great Depression, Americans felt they should concentrate on domestic affairs at home rather than getting involved in foreign affairs. Although American casualties represented only a small proportion of the nearly 10 million soldiers killed in the war, the specter of entering another European war scared Americans. While many Americans were troubled by the rise of totalitarian regimes in Italy, the Soviet Union, Japan, and Germany, they preferred to think of them as the problems of other people, not America. In the United States, a Nazi organization, the Bund, emerged. Made up of extreme conservatives and German immigrants who felt a loyalty to Germany, the Bund even had a rally in Madison Square Garden in New York City. North Dakota Republican Senator Gerald Nye had conducted investigations into the munitions industry and concluded that their big money greed was a significant factor in drawing the United States into World War I. Harold Gray, the cartoonist creator of Little Orphan Annie, Tomorrow, Tomorrow, the popular comic strip and radio character of the 1930s cast Annie's mysterious benefactor as a wealthy war profiteer, Daddy War Bucks. By the mid-1930s, as military violence instigated by these new totalitarian regimes was breaking out in Ethiopia, China, and Europe, Congress moved fast to pass a series of neutrality acts forbidding American companies from selling munitions or war-related materials to belligerent warring countries. Americans watched as Spain became embroiled in a civil war between a conservative nationalist faction supported by Nazi Germany and fascist Italy and the Republican forces that fought unsuccessfully to maintain a democratically elected government. Here is the painting Guernica by Pablo Picasso, which portrays the nationalist bombing of the Republican-held town of Guernica during that war. A small number of idealistic young Americans went to Spain to fight with the Republicans, even forming their own Abraham Lincoln Brigade of volunteers. American journalist and writer Ernest Hemingway went to Spain ostensibly as an observer, but supported the Republicans in his writing as well as in his actions. Hemingway's novel, For Whom the Bell Tolls, tells the story of fictional Robert Jordan, an American volunteer who fights with a Republican unit. One of the most prominent Americans to oppose intervention in Europe, particularly to support the besieged English who had not fallen under Nazi domination, was Charles Lindbergh. In 1927, Lindbergh, a shy and unassuming male pilot, flew his airplane, the Spirit of St. Louis, solo nonstop across the Atlantic Ocean from New York to Paris, France. The massive main fuel tank for the plane cut off his forward view and he had to navigate by looking through a periscope or poking his head out the windows on the side of the plane. Taking along a thermos of coffee and a bag of sandwiches, the flight was 33 and a half hours long and on top of that, Lindbergh had been awake for 12 hours before taking off. When he landed in Paris, he was instantly an international hero. He was welcomed back to the United States with a New York City ticker tape parade, christened the Lone Eagle, and a new jazz dance, the Lindy Hop, was named after him and his hop across the ocean. 
1936, seeing a propaganda opportunity, Hermann Goering, Hitler's right-hand man and chief of the German Luftwaffe, its Air Force, invited Lindbergh to visit Germany to inspect the advances the Germans had made in airplane technology. Although the Germans were officially limited by the Treaty of Versailles to keep their military small, they had made significant strides in airplane design. Lindbergh was impressed with what he saw, and the Germans were impressed with Lindbergh, awarding him with a special medal to commemorate his visit. Back in America, Lindbergh spoke glowingly of the Nazis and was an enthusiastic spokesman for America First, an organization that aimed at keeping the United States out of European affairs, but was also prepared to stand aside as Hitler swept through Europe. In 1940, Lindbergh was actively campaigning against Roosevelt's re-election and against the United States providing military aid to Britain. As American sentiment swung more and more against the Nazis, Lindbergh's own popularity began to diminish along with the group America First. It was not helped any by his refusal to denounce and return the medal given to him by the Nazis. Folk singer and Dust Bowl troubadour Woody Guthrie penned a song that was a scathing attack on Lindbergh and his wife Ann Morrow as well as the American Firsters. Woody Guthrie wasn't afraid of speaking his mind and uh, that can get a person in trouble every now and then but that didn't seem to bother Woody. He spoke out against Lindbergh and America First in this song here. <laughs> Even Theodore Geisel, later known as Dr. Seuss, took a stand against the tie between America First and the Nazis. In this famous cartoon by Roland Kirby, Lindbergh is portrayed en route to Berchtesgaden, going to the site of Hitler's home in the Alps. He is flying an umbrella stamped with the word appeasement. This is a direct reference to Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister before Winston Churchill, who was always seen carrying his umbrella. In 1938, Chamberlain famously met with Hitler in Munich after Hitler had taken the Sudetenland portion of Czechoslovakia and after he had occupied the Saar Basin and annexed Austria. Basically, Hitler promised Chamberlain that he was done taking land and Chamberlain announced to the world that he had achieved peace in our time, which soon turned out to be not the case at all. Chamberlain's policy of appeasement clearly did not work, and Chamberlain was disgraced. 
Since then, any time a government accommodates aggression by another government is branded appeasement by those who oppose the accommodation by bringing Hitler's aggression to mind. As the 1930s wore on, Roosevelt had seen the writing on the wall, and he knew that joining in the war against Germany, Italy, and Japan was not a matter of if, but rather when. Roosevelt had been working astutely and diligently to prepare America for war without losing the support of American voters. Although isolationist Republicans in Congress opposed him at every step of the way, Roosevelt believed the need for assisting Britain became acute with the fall of France in 1940. Roosevelt managed to circumvent the restrictions of the Neutrality Acts by instituting a Lend-Lease with Britain and cash and carry policy that extended to free France and the Soviet Union. Desperate for war materials, Roosevelt arranged to lend Britain 50 American destroyers in exchange for the right to base American naval installations in British territory in the Atlantic, primarily Newfoundland and Bermuda. Roosevelt explained to the American public it simply by saying that if one's neighbor's house was on fire, one would naturally lend a hose to help put out the fire. Roosevelt's critics balked, but his plain use of words once again triumphed. Cash and carry obliged a nation to whom we were selling war materials to pay for those materials up front instead of by loan, and that the purchasing country was responsible for getting the material back themselves. This did away with the extension of credit and problems with enemy submarines, German U-boats, that caused so much trouble during World War I. Roosevelt also amazingly managed to institute a peacetime draft in the United States, the first ever in its history. Although we were not at war, the Selective Training and Service Act of 1940 was passed, which required men between the ages of 21 and 35 to register with their local draft board, and they would be chosen by lottery. The act authorized a limit of 900,000 men who would serve for 12 months after selected and would continue as reservists for 10 years after that or to the age of 35, whichever came first. Draftees could only serve in the Western Hemisphere or in U.S. territory in other parts of the world. Of course, the U.S. was still not fully out of the Great Depression, and this was viewed as a rationalization for a work bill. By October of 1941, it was clear that the United States was going to be entering the war against the Axis powers, Germany, Italy, and Japan. Already in the North Atlantic, American naval ships were operating under a shoot-on-sight order for German naval vessels, and American merchant ships were being armed with deck guns. The United States was already waging an economic war with Japan by withholding airplane fuel and scrap iron with the Japanese desperately needed to sustain their aggression in China. Unbeknownst to the American people, Japan had already authorized plans to strike the American base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. The attack came on Sunday morning, December 7th, 1941, as Franklin Roosevelt would call it, a day that will live in infamy. American isolationism had come to an end. After his moment of fame, Charles Lindbergh became a tragic character. In March 1932, his baby was kidnapped from his New Jersey home in what was described as the crime of the century. Two months later, the baby's dead body was found not far from the home. In 1934, a German carpenter, Richard Bruno Hauptmann, was arrested for the crime. Found guilty with evidence that is still questioned today, he was executed in 1936. The crime drove Congress to pass the Federal Kidnapping Act, which is also known as the Lindbergh Law. The catchphrase, America First, reappeared in the 2016 presidential election, much to the dismay of people who remembered its use in the 1930s. In 2004, American fiction writer Philip Roth wrote an alternate history, The Plot Against America, in which Charles Lindbergh was elected president in 1940. The story is from the perspective of a Jewish family living in New Jersey. Roth broke onto the literary scene with his 1969 novel, Portnoy's Complaint, which was controversial at the time for its explicit references to sexuality. I read the plot against America and will admit it really hit me hard. It has recently been turned into an HBO miniseries that premiered on March 16, 2020. It is sure to be controversial, but that gives me even more reason to want to watch it.